So our scripture reading <coughs> is, uh, is what started us out. And so we're going to look at the feeding of the 5,000. And um, I want, I mean, so far in our study, we've, um, we've been real academic about it. We've, we, we're trying to, to look at uh, fine points and define our terms and try to figure things out that way. And so what I'd like to do, and I'm, what I'm doing in my own personal study, is I'm, I'm transitioning. I, I'm settled on who God is. I'm sure that uh, this, this, um, this belief will be built upon. Um, I believe even though we've dug deep, uh, we're just scratching the surface. But I'd like to now start applying things that we've learned in the past before we knew about God. And uh, that's what I want to start on today. And uh, I believe that, um, that Christ was clear that he wanted to show us who the Father was. That's, that's what his, besides saving mankind, in saving mankind, he was showing us who, who his Father was. And we see this in the parables, I believe. And uh, today we're going to look at the feeding of the 5,000, and I believe this is a parable. It is a living parable. It's different than some of his other parables. He actually lived it out and was showing us things about him and his father and about salvation and about what he's doing to save us and how it works. So we are going to actually go through the entire chapter. We're going to go through chapter 6, so we're going to be right there starting at verse 1. Uh, we read, After these things Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee. Now, do you know what Galilee means? It means heathen circle. Okay? And I just thought of this when I was going out to get a water. Um, the Bible calls this the circle of the earth. This says, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee. Jesus went over the heathen circle to Tiberias. Okay, so this, I believe right here, first of all, I believe John knew what he was writing. I think John wrote this book knowing who God was and reflecting on his life with Jesus and putting this puzzle together through the entire book. And we're going to look at a little piece of that, of that puzzle. So Jesus is going across the circle, this heathen circle, to Tiberias. Now, do you know what Tiberias means? Tiberias means river of God. But if you go to, look at this map here. If you, if you look at where Tiberias is, this city, there's no river there. So why would this city be called river of God? When you think Tiberias, do you think the everlasting God? the Almighty God. What, who do you, what do you think of when you hear Tiberius? Rome. River of God. Where does the river Tiber reside? It's in Italy, and it flows right through Rome. So, I think John's picking up on this. Okay, so... This river flows through Rome. So the Tiber is to Rome of what the Euphrates was to Babylon. Okay, you're starting to get a picture here? So the symbolism that's here is it's this Tiberius. Jesus is going to Tiberius. He's going into the belly of the beast to save us in this story. And I just put Nazareth on, on the map there. I, I found out an interesting thing about Nazareth. It says it means one separated. And it also means the guarded one. So this is where Jesus grew up. He was one separated from his father. He didn't have the same, um, the same dynamic, the same life with his father that he used to. And I don't believe he ever will. So I thought that was a, a little uh, interesting piece of information. So we'll get right back into, into the text. Verse 2, And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles. So this group that followed him was not spiritually minded. 
they were there, they were literally there for the loaves and the fishes, right? They were there because they were, they were excited about what Jesus could do for them. Their focus was on Rome. And it's fitting. See, we're here in Tiberias, and it has a, a Roman under, undertone. And that's what their focus was on. And what they saw in Jesus was deliverance from Rome. Um, it's like uh, right now you turn on talk radio, and everyone wants deliverance from the government. Don't get messed up in that stuff. Don't get all tangled up in that because you're just gonna, you're just gonna chase your tail and your blood's gonna boil and you're just gonna waste your time. Your confidence should not be in the government. It should be in the government of God. And so this is what Jesus is going to try to do. He's gonna try to take people's focus off of that, off of the carnal and, and to the spiritual. So they're following uh, because of the miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain. Does that conjure up any ideas in your mind? I think of Sinai. So I, I believe there's allusions to Sinai through this story too. Went up, to the, uh, up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. So you have Sinai, you have a story of elders and Moses going up to meet God in the mountain. I believe you have a very similar um, a similar structure here in, in this story. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, I just wanted to stress that, the Passover is a feast of the Jews, it still is, was nigh. Um, verse 5, when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith to Philip, whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Um, one point I want to make uh, before we go on to the next verse is these allusions to Sinai, there's a couple points I want to bring up. One is that you have Moses at Sinai. Now, did Moses have to give anything up to deliver God's people? He had to give up everything. What was Moses in line to be? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. Who was the most powerful power on the planet at that time? Okay? So Moses gave up everything. He gave all he had for God's people. All right? And so we're going to see that. We're going we're to see that in the story here. Verse 6. And this he said to prove him or to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one may take a little. So, two hundred penny worth is probably somewhere around fifteen thousand dollars in today's, you know, and when, when I thought about, when I stopped and thought about this, I thought of the several years that I've gone to GYC, you have like between four and six, seven thousand people there, and they feed all those people in like an hour. And the money that it costs to feed all those people is astronomical. And they do it quick and they do it efficiently. And so my mind kind of went to that and thought, this was a logistical nightmare that they, that they had here. And a very expensive proposition too at the same time. All right, so next verse, um, verse 8. One of, the, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here. And lad means little boy. Um, it also means um, servant and minister. So think of that. It, he's saying that, that uh, he calls him a little lad. Um, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? So this lad, who was a servant, gave up everything that he had for God's people. I think you have a little picture of Moses, and in the bigger picture, you have a picture of Christ in the lad. 
See, Christ is, Christ is playing the source in this parable, I believe. And you have this lad that is just giving everything he has for this situation, for, for the predicament that they're in. Verse 10, and Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now right here, something came rushing into my mind. And uh, I want to read a, um, a, a couple verses in Isaiah that will lead into what came into my mind when, when I read that um, all these people were made to sit down. This, I'm going to read out of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. It says, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be, be such as was in her vexation. When at the first he lightly afflicted, afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her, afflict her by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, Upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation, and not increased the joy, the joy before thee according to the joy in harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil, for thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, and in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now real quick here, a lot of people are perplexed about the Everlasting Father. We talked about this Wednesday night. Real quick, Christ is father to us because Adam was the father of mankind. Adam squandered his birthright. He squandered the privilege of being the, the father of mankind and gave it to Satan. Christ came and purchased that right back. Christ passed the probation, probationary test that Adam could not. That is why he's called the second Adam. And if Adam was the father of mankind, and now Christ is the second Adam, what does that make Christ to us? Everlasting father. So in that sense, he is the everlasting father. It does not need to con uh, confuse the issue of who God is. Yeah. Just a real quick uh, explanation there. All right, so... This, um, this passage in, um, in Isaiah does a little explaining and in, uh, introduction into Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Um, he maketh me lie down in green pastures. So the reason I read Isaiah first is because Isaiah sets this scene in Galilee. And here in Psalm 23, we're shown that we, as servants of God, are made to lie down. We're made to sit down. And that's where my mind went when I read that. They caused the people to sit down. Because it was all about, at this point, it was all about organization. You know, um, from a human standpoint, it was about logistical organization to get, to get food to these, to these people. But what Christ was trying to show them is that there needed to be organization in salvation. All right, so it's not just, a, um, I'm going to do this over here and everyone's saved and they just don't know it. Or I'm going to do this over here and only certain people are going to be saved and it's just going to be out there and whoever accepts it gets it. It's not like that at all. He's trying to show us uh, something about the structure and the process here. So he maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. They're right beside the, uh, the Sea of Galilee. 
He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his, his name's sake. This is what this story is all about. It's all about saving mankind and leading them from a path of um, worldliness and a carnal path to a path of spirituality and being led by the Spirit. So this, this fits perfect. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's what this area was considered. Isaiah says it. In Galilee, the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And Christ was with them. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table. All right? So now we get the food, the food imagery uh, brought into it. In the presence of my enemies, thou hast anointed my head with oil. Now you see the symbolism of what we're going to see, the Holy Spirit being um, distributed to the people. My cup runneth over. We'll see that. Picture the baskets. They're just, they're overflowing, right? In the distribution of this food. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we're going to see that this is the message that Christ just continually told them through this whole story. Like they were looking at the physical, and he was trying to tear them away from that and say, you need to look at the spiritual here, because I'm showing you in living parable how I'm going to save you, and you're not even seeing it. All you're seeing is the physical things around you. So back to verse 10. We'll read the last part of it. Now there was much grass in the place. So there's the pastures. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. So this was just the men. There were women and children too in addition to this. And Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. And likewise of the fishes as much as they would. So here we're, we're seeing a, a little bit of a picture about the, the hierarchy. If Christ is playing the, um, the role in the parable of the Father, then he's distributing the food, the bread, which is the bread of life, to who? The disciples. Okay? So who would the disciples be in, in, uh, in the spiritual scheme of things? The angels, okay? So I just want, I want to build this picture in your head so you can start seeing what Christ was trying to tell them and they just weren't seeing. I hope that we can leave here seeing a little bit about what, what Christ's aims and goals were in, in living this out. When they were filled... He said to the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. So we see the, um, the imagery of the angels, that they are distributing the, the bread of life to those that are, that are sit, uh, sit da set down. Um, there's something to that being set down. They were also organized into groups, very organized. Now the setting down, I believe, symbolizes the, um, the submission that we are to have. You know, we are, we are told to be still and know that He is God. All right? And so they, they were um, symbolically showing their submission to what was going on here. And that's what I believe we're supposed to take away from this, from the perspective of those that were being fed. We're supposed to be 100% submissive. Can you imagine if, if you know, some of the dads and the kids would have gotten up and started running around and doing whatever at this point. It wouldn't have worked. Everyone had to be um, submissive and sit and do what they were asked to by Christ. Um, and this is, this is a, spiritual, a spiritual lesson. In our lives, we have to, um, we have to slow down and realize that God is, con is, is in control and we want to be part of this system. We want to be a part of this system of salvation that he's offering us. If we don't, if we don't submit 100%, then we're not justified. At best, we can hope for God's mercy. 
But we're not going to be led by the Spirit if we're not submitted and we don't sit down in these green pastures. What we also see here is we see an unlimited supply. These baskets were overflowing, okay? And again, Christ is trying to tell us something here. It, there, there's not limited salvation. There's not only a few spots in heaven for us, and it's first come, first served. There's unlimited supply, but there's not unlimited workers, and there's not unlimited people that even want it. That's the problem, and we're going to see that in Christ's words. Um, he's, gonna, he's going to um, convey to those that are listening um, some things from his Father's perspective and um, what his Father's will is. So we have unlimited supplies of food, and this food represents grace. It represents the Holy Spirit, the divine influence upon these people's hearts, and then its reflection in their lives. And we know that grace is the Spirit of Christ. Steps to Christ, page 52. Now, I think it's interesting that um, Christ told them to gather up the extra. I thought about this for a while, and it wasn't making a whole lot of sense, but then I thought of the story of the ten virgins. You have five foolish virgins and five wise now, the wise virgins, what did they have? They had the oil, okay? They had the bread. What about the foolish? They, had, they didn't. They wanted to buy oil. They wanted to borrow oil. What was the answer? We don't have any to give, give to you. It was all picked up. All the extra was picked up. There's, you can't just go and find oil laying on the ground. There's no extra oil. There's abundant supply if you ask and you submit. But they were sleeping, along with the others, but they were foolish because they didn't ask for the oil. They didn't do what was required for the oil. And so that makes sense that, that they didn't just leave this bread strewn all over the ground. They picked it up because it's not just for anybody. It's for those that submit and those that ask. Let's see, what verse are we on here? Um, therefore, I believe verse 13. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remain over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men which had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. I mean, so they see something here. They obviously recognize the miracle, but I don't believe they're, seeing, they're not seeing this picture that he's trying to portray. Verse 15, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. All right, so Jesus is waiting for a response, a positive response, about them seeing that this is about the kingdom of God, and what did he get? He got Tiberius talk, right? They were, we want deliverance from Tiberius, and this is the guy that's going to do it. They can surround us, but he'll provide us food. We can get sick, but he'll heal us. The, their mind was still on the, the flesh, and he was trying to... Uh, pull their mind somewhere else and be focused on the Spirit. And it wasn't happening, so Christ withdrew. I'm going to read this quote from Review and Herald, and uh, I think it, it helps us with this, this picture. It says, The angels of God are ever moving up and down from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth. All the miracles of Christ performed for the afflicted afflicted and suffering were by the power of God through the ministration of angels. So we see this picture here. The needs of the people were met by God, were met by Christ through the ministration of the disciples in this picture. But what, it, what I believe it is, it is portraying here is the spiritual realm. 
You have, the, have God providing through the ministration of his angels for the people. Christ condescended to take humanity. And thus he unites his interests with the fallen sons and daughters of Adam here below. While his divine grasps the throne of God and thus Christ opens the communication of man with God and God with man, all the blessings of God to man are through the ministration of the holy angels. So this is, I believe this is a summary of what we're looking at in this parable. Um, we read in, um, well, we just read that Christ condescended to take humanity. How long is that going to last? I believe it's going to last forever. I do not believe Christ went back and it's business as usual for him and his father in their relationship. I believe that relationship is going to be different for eternity. In Desire of Ages, page 25, uh, she writes, through eternal ages he is linked with us. So I believe it's pretty clear that he's going to retain the scars, he's going to retain his humanity forever. Now Christ did not have humanity before the incarnation. And so there is something different. We have to acknowledge that. And his condescension was um, almost infinite, Ellen White puts it. And so we can't even measure that condescension. And so when we try to tell people that, yeah, Christ was given back everything that he had before, I don't, I don't see that that's accurate. I don't think I can say that um, because I believe his condescension was, was permanent in many ways. Okay, back to uh, chapter 6 of John, verse 16. And when even was come, his disciples went down to the sea, so they're going back into this sea, and entered into a ship. Um, what, uh, we learned several weeks ago, what is the ship? You know, we're always told, stay with the ship. And most people say the ship is the organization, right? Um, Ellen White doesn't say that. Ellen White says, uh, she calls it the gospel ship, okay? So the disciples had a ship, and they had a gospel, it's a gospel ship, okay? This is, um, this is how they moved forward, and I think this ship is going to play a little, a little role here too. They entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. Now we have another name of another city. Guess what the name Capernaum means. So think about this. Christ is in um, Tiberias, trying to pull them out of, of Babylon, of Tiberias, the Roman uh, river from God, okay? See, now Christ, Christ is trying to teach us about this river that flows from the Father, right? But they're focused on the river that flows from the Roman God. The Tiber is in Rome. The Tiber flows through Rome, okay? So there's two, there's two things we can focus on. There's two rivers. There's two streams of life. And one is a stream of life, and the other is the real stream of life. So they're going from Tiberias to Capernaum. Any guess on what Capernaum means? It means village of comfort. I think, I think John knew just what he was writing when he was, when he was uh, telling this story. And he was probably just laughing inside at all the rich symbolism that's in this story and all that the readers were going to potentially get if they dug deep enough. All right, so they entered a ship and went over to the sea toward Capernaum, and it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. So they left without Jesus. He went off into a mountain by himself, and they waited till dark, but he didn't show up, and so they got in their ship, their gospel ship, their ship of truth, and uh, went, went across towards Capernaum. And the sea, let's see, we're at verse 18, and the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. Now, does that bring anything to mind? They're, they're going towards Capernaum, Capernaum, the village of comfort, 
and a great wind started blowing. My mind goes to Acts. I don't know where your mind goes. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto their ship, or unto the ship, but it's their, their ship, their gospel ship, and Jesus is coming towards it. And they were afraid, but he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Now look, I, here's the map again. So Tiberius, Capernaum is uh, just off of due north from them, across the Sea of Galilee, and 25 furlongs is about three miles, and there's about six miles journey from Tiberias to Capernaum. So they're out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. They were not, I want to stress, they were not, according to the story, they were not by the coast. So it wasn't like Jesus was walking in shallow water. They were out in the middle, and I believe this is why John says where they were. You know, they weren't hugging the shoreline, they were between the two, and um, they were almost exactly halfway when Jesus appeared to them. Um, then they willingly received him into the ship. And immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. Okay, so they're three miles offshore, and as soon as they received Christ into their gospel ship, this is hugely symbolic. They received the real Christ, the one that was trying to tell them about the gospel and give them the logistics behind how God saves them through the ministration of the angels. And as soon as they received him into the ship, what happens? Boom. They're right at the village of comfort. Yeah, they, it's, it symbolizes the trans, transformation that takes place in us. When we receive the real Jesus into our gospel ship, that's the ship we need to stick with. That's the ship we need to save, uh, um, stay with. Ellen White says that that is the ship in which Christ is the captain. That's the ship that's going to be safely gu guided into harbor. It's the ship of comfort. It's the truth. It's the gospel ship. Let's see. Um, another thing that's interesting about this, I'm a, as I read through this, my mind was just taken all over the Bible. But their ship was three miles out to sea. And when they, when they invited Christ into the ship, they appeared at Capernaum. So, has that ever happened before in another story? Philip and the Ethiopian, right? It says he was taken by the Spirit to another city. I believe that's what's happening here. We have the same, the same, uh, we have Christ. Christ is the Holy Spirit. We don't want the Spirit of another, we want, Christ. We want the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus Christ. So again, we have, we have this picture that um, I think was repeated in a sense, this same phenomenon where the Spirit can take you where he wants you to be in that story of, um, of Philip. In uh, Review and Herald, 1894, January 2nd, uh, Ellen White writes, God has not placed those of you who imagine to see faults in others and in the work to guide the ship of the gospel into the harbor. The Lord himself is at the helm. And so this is how she, she um, uses the ship uh, terminology in her own writings. Um, Review and Herald, January 2nd, 1894. And if I give any references and you don't catch them, I can give them to you after. Verse 22, the day following when the disciples which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save the one hereunto his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, how be it came other boats from Tiberias 
nigh unto the place where they did eat bread after the Lord had given thanks. So they couldn't figure out how this happened. How did Jesus make it here as fast as his disciples when he didn't get in the boat? So they're perplexed. They see miraculous things happen. or They saw these miracles happening, but their minds were still on the carnal. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. So they come to the village of comfort seeking Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? So they still wanted to know how he got there. They didn't want to, they didn't want to know what he was trying to tell them when he fed them. They just wanted to know, hey, how do you do this, how do you do this trick where you just appear? If you, if you tell us that, then we could probably defeat our enemies. Um, we could, we could uh, get out from under this oppression that Rome is, um, is inflicting on us. And Jesus answered, answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him God the Father has sealed. All right, so again, he, for the rest of the chapter, he is just going to pound into them that I am not talking about physical things here. I'm talking about spiritual things here. And you don't understand who I am. And if you don't understand who I am, you don't know the Father. And so right here, he says something that intrigues them. And I don't know exactly what they thought about being sealed, but they were interested in this because he said the Father had sealed him. Then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? They're like, well, this sealing must have something to do with him being able to make food multiply, and be able to travel across the sea without being in a boat? What can we, what, how can we do these works so that we can do what you do, these miracles? Again, their minds were not where Christ wanted them. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him who he, who he hath sent. It's like, slow down, Get your mind out of the gutter and focus on me. If you know me, you will, you'll know how these things work. You'll realize how this all works. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? So it's like it doesn't matter what he says. They still want to know, how can, how can we do this? How can we do this too? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So then they, they're uh, bragging a little bit about their heritage. Like, yeah, we, we have miracles in our heritage too, and we want to get back to that. So tell us how you're doing this, and then we can have that again, because you kind of did something like what Moses did. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. So there again, focused on the carnal, he's trying to pull their mind out from that. Verse 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth light unto the world, life unto the world. Then Jesus said unto him, Lord, Oh no, then, then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. So again, they don't care what he's saying. They just want the bread. Okay, if bread's the way, if bread is the way I can do miracles, then give me the bread. You know, and then, I'll, then we can do the miracles. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. They're asking for the bread and the bread's right in front of them. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. That reminds me of the women at the well. Shall never thirst, right? 
Speaking of the same thing, we're just using different, um, we're using different, uh, different symbols here. You got the bread and you have the water, same thing. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Verse 36, but I say unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So now he's focusing on the Father's involvement in this. And what he's saying is there are individuals that the Father has procured because they have sat down and submitted and received the bread that is being distributed. Okay? And Christ is saying, after they have received this bread that has been distributed, they are his. Now he is the father of them. He's the second Adam to them. And he says, these ones that come to me, I will not cast out. So again, he's basically going over the same ground he went over uh, on the mountain. Verse 39, and this is the Father's will. So now he's, now he's uh, um, sharing with them what the Father desires for them. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day. So he's saying the Father is not this mean dictator up there. He's doing everything he can to save you. And as soon as he procures you, he gives you to me, and we keep this thing going. We build you into the image of the Son. And, he and the Father doesn't want any of you to give up. And we're going to see here that there was someone who gave up, and it's the, one of the worst uh, pictures of someone who uh, went apostate. Verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He keeps covering the same ground. See, there might be something here that I didn't... Yeah, it's just a, it, it's just a reiteration of uh, John 17, 3. This is life eternal. Uh, verse 41, the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which come down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I come down from heaven? So now it's, it's fighting words. They, 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 get, they get just the tip of the iceberg, and they're like, oh, wait a second. He's saying that he's from heaven, and they don't like that. Jesus therefore answered and said unto him, murmur not amongst yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. He keeps ending these, these sentences with, if you fit this, I'll raise you up at the last day. Everything you want, everything that you're focusing on here, you can have in the heavenly kingdom. If you would just take your focus off of this and listen to what I'm saying, I'll raise you up at the last day. And they're not seeing it. They want it now. It's just like a little kid. You know, if you wait patiently, at the end of the day, you can have this reward. No, but they want it now. They're not having that. They want, they want their reward now here on earth. One thing that uh, really jumped out at me here is it says the Father is the one that draws us. How is the Father drawing us? Where is he? He's in heaven. But the Father is drawing us. He's drawing us through his Spirit. Okay, and so it's clear here, the Father is the one that draws. Once he gets us, once we repent, once we ask forgiveness for our sins, then the cleansing of all unrighteousness starts. 
Verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every, every man, therefore, hath heard and hath learned of the Father, cometh unto me. Not any man that has seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. And so he, Jesus, Jesus keeps that on a shelf in his mind that they were bragging about Sinai. And he brings it into this explanation. He says, yeah, you're right. You did, your fathers did eat manna. But you're not seeing the picture, the big picture. You're seeing that their bellies were filled. And if that's all you're going to see, what I have for you is this message. Your fathers are dead. Verse 50. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh. Okay, so this is, this is where they get really confused, but you who are seeking truth should not be confused. Because when you're seeking truth, the Spirit will guide you into all truth. And so, his flesh goes, it goes way beyond what they're seeing here. The flesh that Christ came in was fallen human flesh. And that's significant because this is what he has to give us, okay? So he has fallen human flesh that is 100% subdued by the Spirit and is overcoming sin continually. 100% submitted, but 100% obedient. That's what he gives us. He says, the bread that I will give you is my flesh. That's the gift. This is the donation that he gave at Pentecost. It's overcoming power in fallen flesh. The, the, the nature of Christ issue becomes so important when you get to this point in your study because if you believe Christ did not come in fallen flesh, then he has nothing for you. Not on this earth. You'd have to subscribe to the magic wand theory that says We'll be sinning till Jesus comes, and then he'll wave the wand, and then he will give us this unfallen flesh that he had while he was here on earth. That's not the way it works. This is the flesh that he wants to give us, the bread of life, which I will give for the life of the world. This is the only thing that can give us new life, is Christ's fallen flesh in humanity that overcomes sin. The Jews, therefore, strove, strove amongst them, among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Like, they've totally checked out at this point. All right? So they're just thinking, this is sick. This guy is sick. But they should be, they should be eating this up. <laughs> they should be hanging on every word and seeing all. Like, they have all these stories in their mind. They have Sinai. They know what happened there. They should be putting all these pieces together, and they're not. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. I, they, they're, if they weren't gone before, they're totally gone now. Okay? This flesh is the righteousness that he gives us. It's that robe of righteousness that he wove while here on earth that was actually being woven in heaven for him through his life. And he gives that to us as a gift. Now the flesh is that righteousness that allows us to live a righteous life. That's what saves us. The blood, the drinking of the blood, that is what, sim that, that's symbolized by his death on the cross, the shed blood. That does something different for us. His death on the cross gave us a life of probation. 
And that life of probation is that one that Adam failed at. He was not supposed to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he was supposed to pass, pass that probationary time without disobeying God. And if he would have done that, we're told that all of his offspring would have been born righteous. So the repopulation of heaven would have happened by a father of mankind and a mother of mankind that produced offspring that were righteous until the number reached that which God had chosen and heaven was set back in place. And then Satan and his angels could have been dealt with. In Romans 5, verse 10, we read, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. So this reconciliation spoken of here is not justification. It's not salvation. It is bringing us back in so that we don't have to be destroyed immediately. Ellen, what Ellen White says about um, when Adam and Eve uh, sinned, she asked the question, the rhetor or not, not even a rhetorical question, she was going to answer it right after, but she says, why were they not destroyed at once? She says, because um, an offering was found, and Christ stood between the living and the dead. And so, it was not God's, and she says in another place, it wasn't God's intention to destroy them immediately, but that was the rule. His intention was to save him, but nobody knew that but God. So, what happened with the death of Christ and the promise that he would come and die was that we were set back on level, a level playing field and we now had the life of proba probation that Adam was afforded. And a life of probation that was given to Christ. Christ had the same life of probation given to him in the incarnation. And so this is what we're talking about when we're talking about reconciliation. We were reconciled to God so that we could now prove to him whether we were going to be loyal to him or loyal to Satan. And after this, uh, we read in Romans, much more being reconciled, so we, we were given this life of probation, we shall be saved by his life. That's the bread. That's the water. That's the transformative power. And when we first accept that, we're justified. And we remain justified as we remain obedient. Reconciliation is different than salvation. Verse 54, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Do you think Christ is getting tired of repeating himself? But he just wants to get through to them. He's saying the same thing over, so they'll stop and say, wait, he just keeps saying this. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And instead of hearing what he's trying to tell them, they're, just see, they're, they're probably just repulsed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father. Now that's a very non-Trinitarian statement right there. Christ is saying himself, I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. So he's setting up this hierarchy. He's now again painting a picture of the hierarchy in heaven. And it goes Father, Son, angels, us. And we see that in the, uh, the living parable of the feeding of the 5,000. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. So he, re <laughs> he reminds them once again, your fathers, where are they? They're dead. <laughs> he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Let's get your mind off the carnal and start focusing, trying to see what, what is being spiritually fed to you right now. And they're just closing their lips going, mm-mm, I don't want it. Verse 59. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Now this blew me away. He's not teaching this out in a field somewhere now. He made his way into the synagogue and he's giving these truths about who God is. 
That's how you know your days are numbered. <laughs> if you're in the synagogue preaching this message, you won't be there long. So he's teaching this in Capernaum. He's giving the comfort message in the village of comfort now. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it. So even his disciples were saying this. I don't know about this. He said unto them, does this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So he, he's, being, he's getting more and more blunt now. He's speaking to his disciples. It sounds like it's almost a quiet conversation between him and his disciples. If not that, everyone else had, had left by this time. Or most. Um, let's see, there might have been something here. Yeah, I thought it was uh, interesting. It says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. For us, these words are in book form now. So it's the word that speaks to us. And everything written in this book is spiritual. And if you're not spiritually minded, if you're carnally minded, this is just a book of stories. It's just words on a page. But when you have God's spirit living in you, then these words become much more. You can understand them. He becomes the teacher of righteousness for you. And he will teach you the things that are written, written here. That's why they are spirit and they are life. Verse 64, but there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore I say, I said unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given him unto my fa un given unto him of my father. For that time many of his disciples went back and walked with walked no more with him. So this was he he had said too much at this point for them. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Amen. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, that Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Now that's truth. Amen. Now whether or not Peter was feeling it really, or if he was just being Peter, not sure. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve? and one of you is a devil. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. In manuscript 67, we read, here we have an explanation of that statement made in John 15, 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and are burned. Christ had come to the time when the truth must be spoken decidedly, that the disciples who were indeed in the vine might be distinguished from those who had no vital connection with Christ. And I believe that is, that is what was actually happening here too that he was reaching a point where he was trying to really uh, get this across to the disciples, even in chapter 6. And here was a branch who apparently was one with the vine, but after living with the disciples and listening to the words of Christ, he gave evidence that he was not abiding in the vine. Have not I chosen you twelve, said Christ, and one of you is a devil. And so he's talking about Judas here. Judas was with him. He wasn't chosen to fail. He was chosen to succeed. All of us are chosen to succeed in this. 
in salvation. And, and Christ said over and over, it's my Father's will that none of you are lost. Every one of you that he's given to me, I'm not going to cast out. But you have to submit. You have to lie down in the green pasture and know that I am God and submit to this plan I have for you because I want to make you into something else. I want to make you into the Jesus Christ that you read about and that you're experiencing uh, through a relationship with him. So this is all of our, this is, this is an appeal for all of us today. And I'm going to close with this. It's in, found in Isaiah chapter 55. And it's just, I'm just going to read verses 1 through 3 here. And uh, so I'll, I'll read it. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And we see what the waters are clearly now, right? There are, there are two streams and we have a choice between the waters that flow from the throne or waters that flow from Rome. <laughs> and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Now doesn't that seem weird? We're talking about water, but then we're told, if you have no money, come and buy and eat. So after looking at this parable, we understand what that means, right? The bread and the water are synonymous. And it says, he that hath no money, is it free? As far as this is concerned, yes, it's free. But you have to give everything for this. So in that sense, it's not free. You have to put all on the altar. You have to give everything that's in your lunchbox. And Christ gave everything for us to save us. He asks us to give everything of ours so he can replace his righteousness in place of ours, which is filthy rags. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore, do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me and eat ye that which is good. And let, let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. So that's my appeal to you today. And um, I, will, I will continue to go over some of these parables and try to dig out these truths. And... Um, as you go throughout your week this week, I, I appeal to you to, um, to lay down and picture that story. Lay down in those green pastures and sit and ask God to do for you spiritually what he did for the 5,000 physically. <laughs>